a collection of all the issues together, reissued in a, in a volume. Now, um, before delving into the analysis of Tess, uh, I have, first of all, to contextualize the, the text, to contextualize the novel, because uh, um, it is a novel that somehow tries to change the perception of women and, most of all, the perception of women's purity, which was one of the most important aspects the Victorians were absolutely obsessed about when it came to the notion of femininity. So, uh, as usual, as you know, I always try to interact with students. So, um, I will start with a provocative question. Uh, you know that uh, uh, women in Victorian times were supposed to have uh, a background position. They were not regarded to be the leaders of society. So, how comes, how is it possible, and how um, could uh, uh, they manipulate things in such a way as to have a woman as the most important figure? Because we know that uh, Prince Albert was important, but the most important figure in England in those days was Queen Victoria. So, Victoria, a woman, the head of the state, and yet supposedly uh, adhering to the canons of femininity. So, how do you think they compromised? How did they find a solution to, obviously, uh, what was an obvious problem? What do you think? Come on, try to guess. First of all, have you seen uh, um, some pictures of Queen Victoria? I'm sure you have. I'm sure yes, you have. Okay. Yes, so, uh, if you, if I can share the screen, I will see whether I can do it. I will show you some uh, pictures of Queen Victoria. Uh, let me see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Let me see whether I can share it. Can you see it? No? Can you see anything? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Ma so you can see the pictures of Queen Victoria? Yes, ma'am. Can you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, good. So what do you notice by just looking at these pictures? What do you see? Come on. What um, is... please, please repeat, ma'am. Yes, please. Just, just repeat once again, ma'am. I ask you, what do you notice about the way Queen Victoria portrays herself in front of the audience because obviously pictures were shown, pictures were public. So pictures contributing to creating a certain idea of femininity and of a queen woman. Okay, how is it possible that, uh, I mean, she was the head of the state, but yet, if you look at these pictures, how does she project herself? Does she project herself as a woman of power? Yes or no? Ma'am, by, ma by viewing these pictures, uh, I don't think so that... Uh, See, uh, the, do, uh, did possess that, that things. Okay, so if you look at the pictures, she is always with her husband or with the family, or when the husband died, so look at the second picture, she's wearing black and she's very serious because obviously when her husband died, she lost her smile. 
okay? So she projects herself as a wife and as a mother, okay? Not as a powerful woman, because women were not supposed to be in the lead in those days. And if you also look at her eyes, her eyes are always looking elsewhere. She's not looking at the camera. She's not looking out to uh, face whoever is looking at her. She's always looking in a different direction, always with her eyes cast down, because she has to project herself as a pure, domestic, and submissive woman. Okay, are you there? Yep, yes, ma'am. Ma okay, excellent. Now, in the second slide, and I hope you can see it, you find uh, uh, some descriptions of the angel in the house, which corresponds to the idea of femininity that the Victorians had created or fabricated. Because we can really speak about a fabrication of the ideal of woman. Uh, women had to be pious, domestic, and submissive, as I have already told you. And both literature and medical science converged to create such a figure. If you look at the first quotation, the first quotation is taken uh, from a book by Alexander Walker, who was probably the most prominent doctor in those days. And he speaks as a scientist, as a doctor. And he says, and I read, the man naturally governs, the woman as naturally obeys. The qualities of sensibility, feebleness, flexibility, and affection enable woman to accommodate herself to the taste of man and to yield without constraint even to the caprice of the moment. So, as a doctor, uh, Alexander Walker established some kind of uh, biological connection with uh, um, the separation of the roles between men and women. So men, naturally, by nature, is the, the, the will of God also, that men governs and women obey. Okay? So... The roles were clearly established and they were absolutely different. If you look at the second quotation, uh, it's actually not a quotation, but a list of volumes that Sarah Stickney Ellis, one of the most important writers of the Victorian period, had created. She was a writer of conduct books, and conduct books were very, very popular manuals according to which the rules were set for the behavior of men and women. Okay, so Sarah Stickney Hellis, if you look at the titles, wrote The Women of England, Social Duties, Domestic Habits. Then, Wives of England, relative duties, domestic influence, social obligations. And then mothers of England, influence and responsibility. As you can see from these texts, the only three roles that women could cover were the roles of being women of England, so representative of the nation, then uh, wives, and then mothers. So uh, Sarah Stickney Hellis never thought of writing a book entitled, I don't know, uh, the, the women business or the business women of England or the entrepreneurish women of England. This didn't exist because the role of women were connected with their biological destiny. Mothers, 
wives, sisters, or daughters. Nothing more than that. If you look at the painting that I put in this slide, the painting itself is also very, very interesting. It is the painting by uh, one of the uh, pre-Raphaelite painters, John Everett Millay, of the wife of Coventry Patmore, one of the most prominent poets of the Victorian era. Probably you have never heard of Coventry Patmore because nowadays he is not at all famous, nor is he studied in our curricula. But in Victorian times, he was really, really well known and appreciated by everybody. And he has to be credited with the invention of the term angel in the house that you are for sure familiar with. Indeed, Coventry Patmore wrote in 1854 a very long poem entitled The Angel in the House and inspired by the domestic virtues of his wife that you can see represented in this painting. Okay, so uh, I will ask you in a second to um, give me your impressions of this painting. But I want you to quote uh, one line first from Coventry Patmore, from this poem. And the line is as follows. <clears throat> Men must be pleased, but to please him is woman's pleasure. So, even in this case, women have no willpower, no possibility to uh, express their own desires or drives. They only have to comply with their husband's expectations. Now, tell me what you think about this painting. What do you think of this woman? Tell me. Come on. Can you see the painting? Ma'am, we can't view that painting. You cannot see it? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Oh. Oh, my God. Uh, let me try again to share it. Um, okay. Or maybe I will give you a link. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can look at yourself. Uh, yes, the painting is here. Uh, just a second. Uh, okay. Now, if you look at Wikipedia, I'm copying uh, the, the link. I'm copying the link in the chat box. Mm -mm -mm. If we have it, yes, we have it. Look at this. Uh, oh, it says that the chat is not available at the moment. All right. Mm. Okay. Uh, I will try again to, to share the screen. But uh, let me uh, try to portray this, uh, this screen with uh, my words. Uh, let me see. I am trying again. Uh, Okay, let me see whether I can share this. Can you see this? No, ma'am. No? No, ma'am. Not visible. Let me see, let me see. Nope. No, you can't see anything. I'm so sorry. Anyway, let me describe for you the painting. And uh, uh, this will probably help you. Okay, in this painting, there is a black background, okay? And in this black background, there is the very pale face of a woman who is completely dressed in black with a pink ribbon. Her eyes are looking upwards as if she was looking at God, looking at the sky or whatever. And she is black, just as the background is black. 
So what kind of impression does it give to you? Tell me. Man, uh, the black color, I guess it is uh, representing something uh, like a darker side of something. Not the darker side. No, for the Victorians, it symbolized the fact that women, yes, yes. It's, uh, it's inside sorrow. Not really inside sorrow. Don't look at black as the color of sorrow. Look at black as the color of invisibility. Okay? So, in this painting, basically, you can only see the woman's face, not her body. Because her body is completely black, like the background. Because the women's body, their uh, biological needs, uh, their urges, the passion, uh, <clears throat> everything that is connected with the body, even the idea that women need to be fed, okay, this was cancelled because if women had to be compared to angels, the angel in the house, then women could not have a body. Okay, so you can only see this beautiful face with perfectly combed and coiffed hair because uh, uh, they have to be proper, they have to be tidy and no body. Okay, women were not supposed to have bodily needs. Um, that's why also, if you take into account the fashion of the Victorians, uh, there is nothing of what we could now call body positivity. All the Victorian women had to be very, very, very slim. And if they were not slim, they were not considered uh, uh, proper women. And they, they looked the same. Uh, all women were uh, uh, encaged in corsets, uh, crinolines uh, that gave women the same hourglass shape. So women were homologated. They were fabricated. They were all the same. They were immaterial. They were proper, pure, innocent, and they had to be childlike. The idea that a woman could enter into the domain of science, even of literature, was considered a terrible violation of what was known as the doctrine of the separate spheres. And when I say the doctrine of the separate spheres, I talk about John Ruskin, who wrote a very important paper entitled Sesame and Lily, in which he codified the two different spheres for both men and women. So, women were relegated into domesticity. They were the so-called angel, angels of the half, and uh, uh, they were like vestals, they had to make the domestic environment pleasurable for the men. Conversely, men were entitled to have the domain over the whole planet. Everything outdoors belonged to the men. So can you compare the domestic sphere of women and the outdoor sphere of the men? There is no comparison whatsoever. And John Ruskin actually codified that with literature. So literature, in a way, at least at the beginning of the Victorian times, contributed to the creation of the stereotype type of the angel in the house, the iconic uh, emblem of womanly perfection. Okay, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, it's perfect. So, uh, if women 
had to have these characteristics, even these physical traits, because as I told you, women were all pale because being dark implied the fact that they were workers. So the real women of the upper class were pale, 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 blue-eyed, blonde-haired, extremely thin, okay, and with no bodily needs. Now, um, this stereotype, as I told you, was perpetuated by many writers. So many writers actually accepted this ideal of womanhood. But some others tried to demonstrate the fact that women had different possibilities. They were just like men. So there were women who were pure, women that were less pure, women that were domestic, and women that wanted to venture outside the domestic domain. So, if, on the one hand, literature with Coventry Patmore, John Ruskin, Sarah Stickney Hellis consolidated this iconic image of perfect womanhood, other writers tried to dismantle or at least to problematize this idea of womanhood. And before arriving to Thomas Hardy, I want to tell you, uh, to mention some other writers who tried to problematize uh, the ideal of womanhood. Uh, first of all, we have uh, uh, Thackeray. Thackeray with Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair is considered, uh, as the subtitle of the novel tells, a novel without a hero. And the two female protagonists are not conformist to this model. One is a femme fatale. Uh, she tries to acquire power and money with all possible means. And the other one is an angel, but she is terribly, terribly boring. So the writer wanted to highlight the fact that if you want women to be immaterial and poor and pure, then they lose also everything that makes a person interesting because they become blank, they become void. Okay, so Thackeray was one. Then also the Bronte sisters undermined this ideal of womanhood. If you take, for example, uh, Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre is a fair example. In Jane Eyre, the protagonist, Jane, uh, has uh, an entrepreneurish nature. She wants to marry who she decides, so she doesn't allow anybody else to decide for her. And in the end, she inherits money. So she becomes the proprietor of a huge quantity of money and a property, which is something that women were normally not entitled to have because the properties were the properties of men only. Um, Emily Bronte, Wuthering Heights. In Wuthering Heights, uh, the protagonist, uh, Catherine, is strong, powerful, strong-willed, and uh, when she is a child, um, she runs uh, even bare feet. She's not at all the stereotype of the perfect young lady. She's active, she's dynamic, and she also decides for herself, which is something that makes her unique in literature. Well, Thomas Hardy um, developed his output in the last, very last decades of the Victorian age. And therefore, he uh, somehow also welcomed in the texture of his works 
all the protests of the suffragist movement, uh, all the uh, vindications of the rights of women that women had tried to give voice to in the two last dates, uh, the decades of the, um, of the 19th century. So, um, in his novels, uh, Thomas Hardy uh, offers to his readership some problems, not ready solutions. And this is something that differentiates Thomas Hardy from all the other Victorian novelists. Take Dickens, for example. Dickens was characterized by his didactic attitude. Dickens used to teach his readers how to behave. Thomas Hardy doesn't want to do that. He believes that uh, uh, this is not the role of a writer. The writer should uh, um, enable his readers or her readers to look at phenomena from different perspectives. So, uh, in the last, last part of the Victorian age, also the relationship between writer and reader changes dramatically. Beforehand, readers were considered as empty vessels to be filled with knowledge and to be filled with moral examples. In the last decades of the 19th century, especially by Thomas Hardy, readers are considered as a part of the creative process. The reader is actively involved in decoding the message conveyed by the novel, which is not at all ready-made fabricated or crystal clear, okay? So, if you think of Thomas Hardy, think of the person that revolutionized the Victorian novel, creating and suggesting problems, alternative views, alternative points of view, instead of feeding his audience with ready-made solutions, okay? Um, we also have to contextualize Thomas Hardy in a period in which the Victorian certainties were somehow starting to shake. Uh, Thomas Hardy writes after the publication of uh, um, Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. So, as you can probably understand the origin of species changed completely even the relationship man god and the certainties that derived from that because before darwin i as a human being believed that the universe was ready-made organized perfectly organized by god and created for men, and man was made by God as his mirror image. Okay, so that was a very reassuring way of looking at reality. After the publication of The Origin of Species, when Charles Darwin highlighted the fact that there is no order in the universe, there is no creator probably in the universe and we are just the product of the evolution from monkeys and primates obviously all the certainties that men and women had crumbled to dust because one thing is okay i am the mirror image of god and quite a different story is saying okay my forefathers were monkeys so even the perception of oneself changes. So, in the last part, in the very last part of the 19th century, uh, the Victorians uh, uh, were invaded by fears. 
they were afraid uh, that uh, uh, their world would end. They were afraid that uh, uh, the process of evolution would arrive until to a certain point and then the man would go back to a beastly condition. They were afraid of regressing to the rank of brutes. Okay, so Thomas Hardy lives in this moment of deep uncertainties and uh, um, in his poetic, he was also very, very, very pessimistic. Uh, he is probably one of the most pessimistic writers of the Victorian age. He believed that uh, uh, three forces are against men. The first force is uh, uh, chaos. Uh, the universe is ordered. Yes, no, the universe is actually chaotic. And chaos deprives, strips men from his own certainties. Okay, so he doesn't or she doesn't know his or her direction. We think we have a direction, but we really don't, because the world is plunged into chaos. First thing. Second thing, the institutions, the church and the state are against men because they strip men of his liberty. So, it's not just chaos, it's also the fact that men and women are caged in institutions that uh, uh, direct men according to the institution's needs. All right? So, uh, when men is not free, women uh, are not free. Okay? Third thing, he believed, uh, Thomas Hardy believed, uh, that sometimes... Uh, and here there is a convergence also of the first studies of psychology, Sigmund Freud, uh, um, the, the psychoanalysis. He was convinced that most of the times we ourselves are our worst enemies. And uh, in a way, he was not wrong. Think of times in your life and I can think of times in my life, but I'm sure that you can share the same uh, view, when you knew exactly that that particular thing was wrong for you. You knew it, okay? For example, I always tell my student, uh, you know exactly that that particular boy or girl will make you suffer. You know it. Okay, because he or she has a reputation. But yet, you go for that particular boy or girl. So, there is some kind of self-sabotage. So, Thomas Hardy was convinced that we sometimes sabotage ourselves. We sabotage ourselves, for example, when we have exams, but outside is a beautiful day, and then we decide that instead of being at home studying for the exam, we want to go for a walk. So we know that this is wrong. We know that we will pay for that, but yet we do it. Okay, so Thomas Hardy was convinced of these things, that the universe is plunged in chaos, that uh, both the church and the state uh, try to undermine the freedom of men and women, and that men and women themselves uh, somehow choose what is wrong for themselves in a form of self-sabotage. And this explains to us why Tess of the Doberville is such a novel, because you will find exactly everything that I have told you up until this moment. Um, I will go deeper into that, but let me ask you first, are you familiar with the plot of Tess? Yes or no? Little bit, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Yes, ma'am. Excellent, excellent. So, um, 
so let's start with the, the title and subtitle, which are provocative. Tess of the Doberville, a pure woman faithfully presented. These are the title and the subtitle. Why is the title provocative? Because, because uh, Thomas Hardy is one of the first writers who decide to attribute as a title of his novel the name of a woman. Also Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, but also Jane Eyre was one of the first examples. Normally, normally, if you think of novels, novels, um, David Copperfield, uh, Oliver Twist, uh, it's always, always a man. Because, as we said at the beginning of our talk, men as the uh, social sphere and women have the domestic sphere. So. A book cannot talk about a woman. A book should be talking about a man. Instead, Thomas Hardy decides to focus all his narratives on a woman. And this is, first thing, challenging. Second thing, you know the story. You know that Tess, Tess as a child out of the wedlock, Okay, she was raped, but still she had a child out of the wedlock. Then she also committed a murder. She murdered uh, her husband. Okay, and uh, uh, therefore she is not pure in Victorian terms. But Thomas Hardy, as a subtitle, chooses a pure woman faithfully presented to highlight the fact that Tess is a victim. She was not responsible for the rape and she was forced by the circumstances to murder her persecutor. But for him, she is a pure woman. So Thomas Hardy is basically cancelling and rewriting the concept of purity for the Victorians. Uh, if you think of what I told you at the beginning of our talk, purity was domesticity, uh, uh, piousness, uh, uh, submissiveness. Tess is nothing of this, but Tess is a pure woman because Thomas Hardy focuses on what is in her heart. She was good and she is good from the beginning until the end of a relationship and the end of the story. It is just the chaos, the circumstances, forms of self-sabotage that force her to appear not as pure as one would imagine. Okay, are you there? So the concept of purity is completely rewritten. In a way, through Tess of the Doberville, um, Thomas Hardy wanted also to criticize um, the industrial society of the Victorians. Every novel by Thomas Hardy can be read as a very, very strong form of criticism towards uh, uh, industrialization, the factories, uh, the fact that the cities were overcrowded, whereas the countryside had been abandoned and uh, the countryside had been also exploited. Okay, Tess of the Doberville and every other novel by Thomas Hardy are actually set in a fictionalized world 
called Wessex, which is a county actually that existed before historical times. Okay, it is as if he wanted his or her protagonists to suggest a renewed contact with nature going against the principles of the Industrial Revolution. This is the reason why the final part of Tess of the Doberville is set at Stonehenge. I'm sure you are familiar with Stonehenge, with all the stones in circles. Stonehenge was some kind of uh, a prehistoric uh, um, temple. We don't know whether it was a temple or it was uh, uh, some kind of uh, um, layout to connect this world with uh, uh, another world. We don't know very much about Stone Age. But the only thing we know uh, about is the fact that Stone Age was connected with nature. Uh, during the equinox, uh, for example, both in December and in June, Stone Age is particularly illuminated and lit by the sun. So it creates an effect. This is because the civilizations, the societies that created Stone Age had a deeper contact with nature. And this deeper contact is what the Victorian men and women have lost. And this is why when she flees from persecution, Tess goes to Stone Age as a place where she can recover contact with nature and where she can find proper shelter. Obviously, this will not happen because she will be incarcerated and then executed. But it is important that as well as rewriting the concept of female purity, Thomas Hardy wanted also to point out to the necessity of re-establishing a contact with nature, something that the Victorians had lost and something that I think we have also lost and need to recover, especially in this moment of pandemic. The very pandemic, as you know, is connected with lack of respect for nature, uh, with the fact that um, we eat and exploit animals, and uh, with the fact that uh, there are intensive farmings, uh, intensive ways of exploiting nature and the natural resources, uh, and somehow these pandemics is showing that nature is striking back. So it's somehow demonstrating what Thomas Hardy had already anticipated at the end of the 19th century, the, the urge to re-establish a contact with Mother Nature. And Tess goes to Mother Nature for shelter. Um, obviously, if you're familiar with the plot, uh, you will have realized that the plot is extremely sad. Uh, that the position, the vulnerable position of women in society is explored and is also um, denounced. Think of Tess. She is the victim of rape and she cannot report the rapist because nobody will ever believe her because the word of a woman is nothing in comparison to the word of a man and her master, because the man who raped her was the son of the person he, she worked for. Okay, so first element. Then the fact that women um, have no other uh, way of uh, uh, gaining appreciation from society rather than preserving their physical purity.
One of the problems Tess has is the fact that uh, her husband will realize that she is no longer a virgin, that uh, she had an intercourse with another man, albeit a violent intercourse, and uh, um, she herself considers her body as damaged. Okay, so it is very, very provocative the way uh, Thomas Hardy explores even the self-judgment of Tess, who considers herself less than before, just because her body is not pure. Okay, so as you can see, there is a clash between the impurity of the body and the purity of her soul, which is something that the writer attaches much greater importance to. Okay, and then there is the fact that women have no possibility of defending themselves. Actually, um, Tess is raped because she was working. Uh, because uh, she ventured outside the home environment, because she had to, she had to help support her family. So Thomas Hardy is saying, women who work are unprotected and they run these terrible risks. So he is showing the Victorian society that uh, um, it's... Uh, apparent uh, uh, propriety, perfection, neatness uh, did not correspond to the reality of the facts. And you know very well, and if you don't know, I will tell you, that women who worked in factories were constantly raped. Because uh, uh, every woman that ventured outside uh, the home environment was regarded as um, a commodity that could be owned and exploited by anybody. So um, the reason why there were so many prostitutes in Victorian England is to be found in the fact that virtually there were no other possibility to work because you either got married and you found a husband who could keep you, who could maintain you, or if you worked in a factory or in any other job, you were raped and therefore you turned sooner or later into a prostitute. So um, Thomas Hardy is showing that, is uh, really flaunting that, is highlighting that, is emphasizing that, and in a way he's slapping Victorian society across its face because Victorian society flaunted its perfection, whereas uh, uh, perfection was not at all one of its characteristics. And Thomas Hardy had the courage to say that because of the context that I told you about, because in this period, even women were battling, they were fighting for suffrage, and many other writers were denouncing social inequalities. So Thomas Hardy was one of them. But for this very reason, he was also ostracized by society. Um, you probably know that Thomas Hardy wrote other novels, uh, one of which is Jude the Obscure which was uh, christened and renamed by the Victorians Jude the Obscene. Well, in this novel, he pushes uh, his denunciations uh, to such an extent uh, as to portray in the novel a child who kills his little uh, siblings because they are too many and there is no food for all of them.
and the child, after killing the siblings, commits suicide. Okay, so this is something that absolutely shocked the Victorians. And obviously, this is uh, uh, an extreme uh, refiguration, ex an extreme portrayal of Victorian society. But these things happened and Thomas Hardy was courageous and brave enough as to write it in his novels. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, comments, uh, I'm here for you. Thank you. Hello. Ma'am, ma'am, yes. Thomas, Hard Thomas Hardy, Hardy's view against women was uh, like anti-feministic or uh, he was sympathetic towards uh, women? Uh, he was my... very sympathetic. He was very sympathetic. He was against uh, the idea that women had to conform to certain ideals. Okay, so uh, he believed that first of all, women were human beings with the same rights as men. And then he believed that under the circumstances the Victorians lived in, uh, women had no protection. So you cannot judge somebody because uh, she, uh, you believe that she is a prostitute. You cannot judge her because you don't know her story. And the story of Tess is the story of a woman who ends up being considered like a prostitute when she was not at all. She was a pure woman and she was a victim of society. Okay? Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you for the question. Ma'am? Yes. Ma'am, um, what is the Thomas Hardy's purpose in writing the case of the D. R. Bills? What is, uh, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't get it. What was the Thomas Hardy's purpose in writing case of the D. R. Bills? Mm -hmm. his, he purpose, was, his purpose was to show that uh, before judging women, you have to take into consideration their background, okay? So you cannot possibly say, oh, she is a prostitute because she had a child who died actually, and she called this child sorrow. It's, it's a very uh, intense moment. You cannot judge a woman because she had a child out of the wedlock. You don't know why that happened. So Thomas Hardy wants society to be more aware of things. Uh, less judgmental and more sympathetic towards whoever is in need. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, Angelic Lear and Alec, oh, which character is more cruel in mind? Ah, they're both cruel because the two of them don't look at Tess uh, per se. They look at what they can take from Tess. Okay, I believe that uh, neither of them is in love with Tess. They're both in love with themselves and they just want Tess to provide them with what they need from her. Okay, okay ma'am, thank you. Thank you. Other questions, other curiosities? Ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, are there any contrast between the Darby Fields and D. Arbor Fields as we come to know? 
Uh, sorry, are there any contrasts between Darby fields and the D Arbor fields as we come to know? I cannot hear you. Ma'am, can I write it in the chat box? Yes, please, please, please. Mm -hmm. I don't think the chat works. It says the chat is not available at the moment. Yes, ma'am. So can you write on that? No, ma'am. Okay. So please try to repeat it again for me. Are there any contrast between D Darby fields and D Arbor fields as we come to know? I don't understand the two items uh, that you are talking. The contrast between D Arbor fields, Alec D Arbor fields, the Darby fields, the Darby fields and, and Darby fields. I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot get it. Okay, ma'am. Actually, it's not possible to write here. That is the problem. Yeah, I know, I know. So, um, contrast between the Dabervilles and... Uh, Darby Fields. D-U-R-B-E-Y. -E yes, this is title. What uh, what's he trying to say? Mm, she's trying to say what the contrast in the title. Taste title Darby Field mm -hmm. and the title of Alec Darby Field. Okay, okay, right. Uh, the problem of titles, the problem of nobility. Um, yes, because the uh, the actually the whole novel stems from the fact that uh, uh, Tess family wants to become uh, richer, more powerful, and therefore they believe that they have a connection with the Duberville family. But then in the novel, they realize that uh, there is no connection whatsoever. This is another important point that you are touching. Thank you very much, Isita. Because uh, uh, Thomas Hardy also um, criticizes in this respect uh, the idea that social classes might evolve, okay? Now, in the Victorian times, uh, um, it was flaunted that people could become rich, they could improve their situation, they could invest, they could become, uh, they could escalate the social ladder. But Thomas Hardy believed that that was not possible. And if you are at the bottom of the social ladder, you will remain at the bottom of the social ladder. And uh, this is exactly what happens uh, in this novel. Because in this novel, we see that the person who is at the bottom tries to escalate, but she can't, and not only goes back to, the, to, to scratch to the beginning, but even to a worse position, because she becomes a murderess, and then she's sentenced to death. So yes, this is another point that Thomas Hardy criticizes. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you also, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, ma'am. So, other questions? Come on. Curiosities about women in the Victorian age. Yes, Ashish. Ma'am, ma is there any injustice uh, against existence? Uh, can we find... Um, can we interpret this theme also, that uh, there is some exist, uh, uh, injustice again, again against uh, existence uh, after viewing or analyzing Tess's character? Mm -hmm. ah, okay, yes. 
As I told you, Thomas Hardy was a pessimist and he lived in a moment when people believed that we were going backwards, we were not progressing. So injustice actually dominates the whole novel and every novel by Thomas Hardy. Uh, injustice uh, against uh, um, even uh, uh, human wishes uh, who are which, which are con constantly frustrated okay so yes uh, I would say absolutely yes um, this is a strong criticism towards uh, reality and uh, um, the proof that men, as Hardy believed, are uh, here not to thrive but to suffer. And uh, um, society is created in crystallized blocks. So if you are wealthy, you will remain wealthy, but if you are poor, you will remain poor. Mm -mm. Thank you, Ashish. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, one more thing. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the hu uh, the actions uh, or the reactions against the plot of the characters or the fate, which is the more more dominating things, dominating uh, a theme. Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. The actions or the reactions or the fate. Okay. Uh, I think that in this case, uh, Thomas Hardy wants to demonstrate the fact that we are all fated. Uh, but fate is not God. Okay? So we are all doomed, doomed to live a miserable life. So there is a fate, there is some kind of order. But this order is not created to favor men or women. This fate actually undermines, pokes fun at men and women. So I would say that fate is the most dominant force, a fate that is against men and women. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, last, last question, ma'am. Yes. Uh, whom, whom, whom you consider as the antagonist of the uh, novel, uh, Alec or, or or Angel, Angel Claire? Okay, it depends because the two of them, as I told you, don't behave correctly because uh, uh, the two of them only look at the surface of Tess. They look at the purity, the outside purity of Tess. Instead, the writer invites his readers to look at the inside of Tess, a pure woman faithfully presented. Okay, so I think that their responsibility is shared. And I also believe that together with Alec and Angel, another important uh, uh, force uh, anti against Tess uh, is her own family. And this is another important uh, element because the family, instead of supporting Tess, instead of trying to understand her sorrow, her grief, her pain, also for the loss of a child, condemns uh, and sentences her. Okay? So, uh, I would say that every single character in the story, maybe apart from her sister, Tess's sister, is against Tess and acts as an antagonist of Tess. She gets no support from anybody. So this is also a way on the part of Thomas Hardy to testify the fact that men and women are alone in the world. There is no God, no human, no entity you can uh, call for asking for protection. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. I don't know whether
if there is any other comment, any other question. Ma'am, ma I, yes. I want to ask a question again. Ma'am, uh, I, I just went through the summary of this novel. I didn't read uh, the text of the novel. Ma'am, uh, here the parts, uh, par here what is the uh, view of person Tringham and what roles, uh, what role does he play in this novel? I, I, I don't is... think, yes ma'am, yes ma'am, please. No, no, sorry, you said, what is the? Wh what role does he play in this novel? Who is he? I, I didn't uh, get it. Uh, Patron uh, Tringham, that, that uh, clergyman, clergyman who tells uh, Dar Darby Field and his family is descended from uh, uh, D.R. Burbill's family. It is a touch of irony on the part of Thomas Hardy. Yes, yes ma'am, that's, that's my view also. Yes, it's a touch of irony and bitter irony because the clergyman who should provide support, moral support, spiritual support, is actually planting in the heads of the family uh, the seeds that will then sprout into evil. So instead of comforting and instead of uh, supporting spiritually the family, he is actually inviting the family to consider the material aspects of life as the most important. So this is a very strong criticism on the part of Thomas Hardy because uh, the church was not supposed to play this role. So um, he is uh, highlighting the fact that even the church is not pure the way it should be. Thank you for this very provocative and insightful question. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am. Um. Yes. Um, uh, why Hardy thinks the extent of international thought is the only possible salvation for the world? Uh, you're breaking up. Sorry. Can you repeat it? Uh, why Hardy thinks the extent of international thought is the only possible salvation for the world? Okay. Uh, the only possible salvation for the world is going back to nature for Thomas Hardy because he believes that we have taken a road that will not lead us anywhere. The, the road of greed, the road of uh, uh, material possessions, the road of accumulation of wealth, okay? If you think the whole story was generated by the fact that from being a poor family, they could become a rich family. This generated everything. So if people had uh, decided to stick to their own life uh, style, uh, tilling the soil, uh, farming the animals, uh, and living naturally in harmony with nature, nothing of the story would have happened. So it is obvious uh, that when Tess looks for a place where she can be herself, a place where she is not judged by anybody, she goes back to nature to this uh, uh, Stonehenge, which becomes symbolic, uh, which becomes emblematic of an age, as I told you, beyond history, before history, before the history of greed and power that men have written up until that moment. So this is why nature is the only solution. Because when we lived, we human beings lived in a natural state, everything in Hardy's view used to run smoothly. When we have parted from nature, 
things have started to change. Thank you for the question. Thank you, ma'am. I don't know whether there is any other comment. I don't know whether you can call Tanmoy if he wants to say something. Is he not in the meeting? No. No, ma'am. He left the meeting. Okay, left the meeting. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, anything else that you would like to ask me? Even uh, uh, something about other topics uh, connected with your syllabus. Maybe I can give you some hints, uh, some different perspectives. Uh, just to ask me. Ma'am, uh, uh, which novelist do you consider as your uh, best best novelist? Victorian, uh, you mean? Uh, the Victorian no, 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 no. No, in no, general. No. In general, yes. Okay, you know that I am a big fan. And, and, and ma'am, ma dramatist also. Dramatist, uh, plays. Both, both, okay. both, both dramatist and uh, novelist. Okay. So, uh, as a novelist, as you know, in, in, in English context, uh, I appreciate very much Mary Shelley. In American context, uh, I strongly advise you to read uh, um, Edith Wharton. I don't know whether you're familiar with her, but she is absolutely fantastic. And you should really read, uh, for example, Ethan Fromm, uh, which is one of the most uh, interesting novels that she wrote. Uh, so, Edith Wharton, uh, Mary Shelley, the Bronte sisters uh, are also among my favorite writers. And uh, as far as drama is concerned, um, I am also very fond of romantic dramas. Uh, Lord Byron's dramas, for example. Uh, you can read uh, um, Manfred. Manfred is excellent. Uh, if you think of more modern and contemporary uh, writers, Eugene O'Neill, American, and also Arthur Miller, American, um, as dramatists are absolutely terrific. So I strongly recommend you to read them. You have a lifetime. You can have all the time in the world to read this, uh, this artist. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. But what about William Shakespeare? Okay, William Shakespeare. Uh, yes, of course, William Shakespeare is William Shakespeare. Um, I think, though, that uh, um, sometimes scholars and critics, uh, especially those scholars who study early modern writers, uh, think that after Shakespeare, there is nothing else. Okay? Uh, there is this prejudice, at least uh, among Italian scholars. You read Shakespeare and you're finished. Yes, Shakespeare is for sure, for sure interesting. But you also have to take into account that Shakespeare is not Shakespeare. Behind Shakespeare, there is the whole uh, age of Shakespeare. He used to compose with actors. Uh, the, the scripts that we have are transcriptions of some of his performances. But some of his performances were changing uh, day after day. And uh, sometimes there was the collaboration of other writers. So there is this myth of Shakespeare. But Shakespeare is not just one person. I would say that Shakespeare is a stream of people. Thank you. OK, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, <coughs> ma'am, why the setting of Hadith poem are all in OS X? Is the place played an important role in Hadith life? Can you repeat it? Because it's breaking up. 
why the settings of hardish poem are all in os6 is the plays uh, played an important role in hardish life as i told you os6 uh, doesn't really exist as a physical place os6 is the name that in the very very past uh, around the times of william the conqueror so we are talking about 1066 was given to a county in the south of england it has a very important meaning in thomas hardy's life and works because it represents this symbol of uh, mm, a time before the industrial revolution a time when men and women had a huge and real and authentic and constant contact with nature so wessex is a green country wessex is always portrayed as full of pastures full of agricultural lands full of farms so it is what we may regard as the anti industrial revolution environment so this is the reason why thomas hardy chose wessex because it is the most uh, it is the furthest thing from the london of its times okay thank you ma'am thank you ma'am yes what is the importance of poets corner the importance of poets corner the poets corner <laughs> okay the poets in, in general you're asking me what's the importance cuz uh, gustav yes ma'am so you're asking me in general why is the poets corner so important in westminster it is important because it somehow acknowledges uh, the contribution that writers poets uh, playwrights have given to the nation i don't know about india but sometimes in italy people tend to forget the importance of culture they tend to forget the importance of literature uh, whereas uh, literature and culture and uh, um, men's imagination and creativity are the stepping stones for society are the grounding stones of society if there was no literature if there was no history of human thought then there would be no men so the poets corner Uh, enables people to be reminded of the importance of literature and of its great contribution to the nation to every nation uh, in italy for example in many churches we have uh, poets corners uh, in santa croce in firenze in florence for example uh it's it's full of tombs uh, of artists uh, uh, painters uh, poets uh, uh, engravers uh, uh, they are consecrated by the fact uh, that their bones uh, are hosted in a church so um in the past uh, the importance of artists was much more acknowledged in italy than it is now and in england still there is a cult of writers uh, think for example also of the famous graveyards uh, i'm also thinking of the graveyards in paris uh, where oscar wilde is buried and i'm also thinking of rome um in rome there is the acatholic uh, protestant cemetery um where percy shelley and john keats are buried and 
every day people go there and bring flowers and pray to uh, pay homage to the greatness of poetry and to the contribution that each and every one of them has given to society and to mankind in general. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, the uh, the horse named Prince, uh, I mean, um, that belongs uh, to Darby Field family. Is there any relief? Uh, is there any uh, significance? I mean, symbolic significance related to the text? Okay, the horse is symbolic because the horse represents nature. Okay, and uh, the death of the horse. Uh, which corresponds uh, to the accident generated by the fact that uh, Tess's father had, uh, I mean, he was drunk because he was so happy, he had turned into a nobleman, then he had passed uh, the, the lead of the chart to Tess, she had fallen asleep and the horse had died and had had an accident. This is all connected. So the death of the horse symbolizes the death of the connection between the Doberville family and the natural world and the beginning of their own end. Yes, so there is a, a strong symbolism in the death of the horse. Thank you. Very, very insightful question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. When, when I gone through the, when I went through the text, I, I, I don't find much about the horse so mm -hmm. that's why I asked the question mm -hmm. yes horse is nature when the horse dies everything changes and why does he die he dies because the father had got drunk he couldn't drive the chart and therefore uh, Tess drove the chart and she fell asleep and why did the father become drunk because he was happy, because he thought he could earn money from the title. So everything is connected and everything is symbolic. Thank you so much. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I don't know. If there are no other questions, I don't know, uh, what is the agreement with Tanmoy? Will he come back uh, or not? No, ma'am. No? Okay. No. So, I am here for you, but uh, you tell me if there is any other question, any other curiosity. You can ask me everything, even... Uh, mm, without connection uh, with this lecture. Any other curiosity you might have from the point of view of literature or also from the point of view of me being in Italy, I don't know, whatever. Ma'am, uh, have you ever visited India? Of course I have. Uh, India is my most favorite country. Uh, I have been uh, yes. Uh, well, the first time I was in India, I was very, very young. And India was really different from what India is now. Uh, when I was 16, uh, now I'm 49, so you can imagine. When I was uh, uh, 16 uh, with my family, we um, embarked into a tour of India. Uh, so, with my family, we visited uh, the most important cities and the usual uh, touristy, but also not touristy, because I went obviously to Delhi, uh, Agra, Jaipur, um, uh, Mumbai, and in those days, uh, Mumbai was called Bombay, okay? Um, then I also went to Varanasi, I went to Matura, to Kajurao. So I went to uh, other places which are off the beaten track. And I remember I fell in love with India. 
with India, with the culture, with the, uh, the generosity and the warmth of the people. And uh, from then on, uh, I went to India several other times, uh, always for lectures. Uh, uh, I went twice to Lucknow in Uttar Pradesh uh, and uh, Gujarat. I was hosted at Auro University. And I really look forward to the end of the pandemics because I really want to go back to India again and uh, it would be nice also to meet you in flesh it would be really a dream yes ma'am we are eagerly waiting to meet with you that would be wonderful that would be really wonderful so let's keep our fingers crossed because i know that the situation in india at the moment is really really critical and i'm really sorry for that i'm praying for india because you really are in my heart Any other comment, question? Okay, so uh, I think that if there are no more comments and questions, I really thank you so much for the attention and uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk. And if you want to write to me, you have my email address. I think I gave it to you last time. And I cannot write it for you in the chat, but you can ask Tanmoy, okay? Uh, email address, a telephone number, whatever. Uh, if I can support you in any possible way in your studies, I will be more than delighted, okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you and best of luck for everything. And I hope Thank to see you, you soon. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Stay blessed and happy, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Bye bye, ma'am.